Well, good morning, Grandview. So good to see each one of you in the house of God today. Do you have hope this morning? Amen. Do you know anyone who does not have hope? Because we should be hope givers this morning, amen? amen. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 6.19, this is out of the Amplified Classic uh, translation, it says now, now, can you just say now with me this morning? Now. We have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It cannot slip. It cannot break down under whoever steps out upon it. A hope that reaches farther and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil. Amen. That is good news this morning. Can you just say that's good news? I have hope. Hallelujah. And you can give hope to other people. And our hope is Jesus.
are our hope this morning. God, we just exalt you in this place today. You are worthy of every ounce of our praise this morning, Father. We love you so much, God. We're so thankful that you're the anchor of our hope, a never-failing, never-changing anchor for us, Father. Thank you so much, God. We just lift our voice right now, and we just say, thank you, Father. You are my hope. You are my strength. You are my joy, God. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. trust in no one else but him this morning no one else gets my hope only God amen, amen. hallelujah hallelujah well, we welcome you this morning we're so glad that you are here so glad that you're gonna be hope givers today amen we're gonna give people hope because people they need Jesus hallelujah well, we're going to just welcome each other this morning. We're going to greet one another in the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. So take a few moments and, and greet someone this morning. Amen?
Well, as you're finding your way back to your seats this morning, we just want to welcome you again. We want to welcome our online viewers this morning. We're so glad that you are um, attending service with us today, even though it's not in the physical sense. Um, as you can tell, Pastor is not here, and I know many of you know that he is, he is on his way to Seoul, South Korea. And um, so you can be praying for him. He's, he's going over there um, for a missions conference. He, he is an emissary through Foursquare Church. And so he's going over um, to a missions conference in Seoul, Korea, where he will meet um, pastors and leaders from India and Sri Lanka that he needs to connect with. And he'll also be able to spend some time with Pastor Kegel as well. So please be praying for him. We, we, uh, we are missing him this morning, but we have a privilege today of having Pastor Steve Ferguson um, join us. Pastor Steve um, was recently pastored for a number of years at the Family Worship Center in Waterton, South Dakota. And it's a four-square church, and he and Pastor, um, he and his family uh, attended here several years ago on a Sunday, and um, he and Pastor had developed a friendship. So we're just honored that he's here today. His family is relocating back to Illinois, and we're excited about that because you'll get to see him and his family um, in more often in our church. So um, it's going to be great. We're so glad for the, the friendship that we have and, and the friendship that we will be building with him and his family. So we welcome you today, Pastor Steve. Um, if you have, yes, <laughs> remember, um, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So let's remember, um, as you're um, leaving today, if you have your offering, just put it in the offering containers at the south door and the east door okay it's a it's a biblical principle that we cannot um ever ignore because god god's blessing is upon our hand that um is giving so um just remember that this morning also we just have a couple of announcements um we're doing the men's brown bag lunch will be this Thursday. It's on the first and the third Thursday. So this Thursday is it, if my calculations are correct. And so it's at 12 noon and it's just over in the lower level of the office building. And that's a glass door. Just go in there at noon and it'll be a great time of fellowship. They've been having a really good time. Also, um, CareNet volunteer training. There's some um, information on the screen behind me. You can call the CareNet office, but we're, we're a, we are partnering with CareNet. Um, we do support them, so um, they need some volunteers. They need good volunteers. And I know we would have the best volunteers right here. So just remember that. If you're interested in doing that, just contact the center and Laura. Also, um, church family, we haven't really said anything about this, but um, and now it's going to be on Facebook. And so, But it is Pastor Appreciation Month. And so I just encourage you, whether it's a card, whether it's, it's a gift, whatever, I just encourage you to be a blessing to our pastor. And I know that many of you are and have already been, but um, I was just telling Pastor Steve this morning, he has been here 30 years. 30 years. That is incredible because you don't find pastors staying for 30 years. Isn't that amazing? And we're so blessed um, to have him as our pastor and Marilyn as our pastor. So just, that was just a side note. Just remember that um, as, you're, as you're going throughout this week, um, it is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we want to honor him. Amen? Amen. All right, as you guys are standing, we're going to enter back into worship. Um, I want to read you guys a quick scripture. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Yeah. <laughs> so some, yeah. sometimes whenever we read that, we're like, oh, I'm not my own. I'm not in control of myself. And, and for those of you that like control, I know a lot of us do. Um, that makes us a little bit uncomfortable. But think about the freedom in God. 
Think about the freedom and the fact that I don't control what goes on in me and through me, that the Spirit of God is at work, that His power is at work, because we know that God's plans are better than anything that we could ever ask for, hope for, or imagine. So let's worship this morning as people who are not our own. Let's worship as children of God and citizens of heaven. Hallelujah. Rushing with fire of God, fall within Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, revival embers smoldering, breath of God, fan us into flame. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit
over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us.
move out of your comfort zone a little bit. We're going to come back to the bridge. Um, we do something in youth called flexing your faith muscles. So this morning, um, you're all sitting around people. We're all family right you. Um, if there is somebody sitting near you or around you, the really cool thing about God is that you can pray for somebody and you can believe for something in their life. You don't even have to know what it is. So I encourage you to find somebody around you as we continue worshiping this morning and pray and speak for the fullness of God because I'm telling you guys something. God wants to do more than bless your food and help you have a good night's sleep. We're praying to the God of the universe. We're praying to the person who set the stars in the sky. We're praying to the person that knew you before you were in your mother's womb and his plan for your life is good. It is good. It can be nothing but good. Even when we don't see God working, God is working all things together for the good. So believe for that this morning. What in your life are you facing that you think there is no hope? God can do it. What are you looking at right now where you think you cannot be freed? God can free you. We are going to pray for that. We are going to believe for that. We are going to flex our faith muscle and we are going to hold God to his word because he is a man of his word and he can and he wants to do it because he loves you. He loves you. Jesus and we bless you we praise you Lord God we thank you that your presence is here your healing power is here Lord God your sovereignty Lord all-knowing and so we can have great peace today Lord Jesus and hope in you and knowing you're on the throne knowing you're here in this place that you've gathered here with us Lord God our affections our worship Lord, is focused on you right now. We give you praise, Jesus. Move in this place. Move in our hearts. Um, we want to move first, Lord. We want to move our eyes and our attention off of us and onto you right now, Jesus. And we want you, Lord God, to have your way and to move as you desire to move, Lord. We bless you. We know that you are the Lord. You're the God of all the universe, and we give you praise, and we thank you that you have chosen to gather here in this place this morning with us Lord God and so we give you praise we pray Lord Jesus that the hearts and the minds here this morning 
Lord God, that we would, as we just uh, soak up your presence here, Lord, that you just begin to move in our hearts, move in our lives, even in our minds, Lord God, that you would move, that you would have reign, that you would have control, Lord God. We want you to change our thinking by your word. We want your spirit, Lord God, to just flow uh, richly in and through us, Lord, this morning. Amen, church. And we want you to have your way. So we pray, God, that you give us hearing ears this morning. Uh, as we just come to the table, Lord God, that your word as it's uh, laid before us, as it's set before us, Lord, what we have need of, Lord, you're going to provide this morning. Because you're a good God. And we love you, Lord Jesus. Uh, we thank you this morning, Jesus, for your presence. Just a special morning, a special sense of God's presence here in this place. Amen. And I'm so thankful for that. Couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine not having the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. It's good to have the presence of the Lord. It's not just good, it's mandatory, right? And we need Spirit of the Lord in our lives. I love that song. It says, um, move, Lord. You don't have to put it up, but that's what it said. Move, Lord. Move in our midst. Sometimes I think it's just us. He wants us to tweak things a little bit. Move our eyes and our attention off of ourselves. Move it on to him so he can move in our lives. Amen. And he's doing that, I believe. What a wonderful sense of God's spirit in this place this morning. I know it's more than just the, the beauty of this place and the sound, the way it resonates. Just amazing here. It's the spirit of the Lord. Amen. And we're so thankful for that. Amen. Just look across at somebody and tell them you're glad they're in church this morning. Why don't you do that? You can be seated. I'm so glad to be in church this morning. I'm just really glad to be with you guys this morning. And um, I'm going to just start by just saying thank you for the opportunity to be here and to just um, sort of share with you a little bit this morning. But before I do that, I just want to tell you just real quick how much I admire and appreciate your pastor. And, um, you know, having pastored for 16 years myself, um, I know what it's like. And I know the challenges and the blessings, the, the wonderful things that you experience pastoring, and I know the difficult things there is with pastoring. And I want to reiterate what Lisa said. It is unusual for a pastor to stay faithful for 30 years. That's amazing. That's truly remarkable. It really is. And I have the utmost respect for uh, Pastor Dennis and, and his wife and family um, to be faithful this long, just to be faithful to the Lord, but to a calling here. You guys have been through a lot over the years to transition here. Um, I met Pastor Dennis um, years ago, I can't remember, Lisa and I were talking, I can't remember how long ago, um, but I've been pastoring during that season of our friendship. We've been staying in touch as he transitioned into Foursquare. I've been a part of Foursquare for quite a few years since the uh, late 80s, and, um, and so I've gotten to see and walk with Pastor Dennis and you guys, many of you all through the transition into Foursquare, and um, just so thankful for what God is doing at Grandview and through Grandview. Let me say, I was just standing there uh, worshiping the Lord and asked the Lord just to speak to my heart. And I want to encourage you with something that I feel the Lord put on my heart. And that is this, that in these days that we live in, sometimes we don't realize or we forget these days in which we live in, there's a great challenge for us as believers and we may not see the pressure rising or understanding, understand why there is a tremendous pressure for the church and for the believer. Um, the enemy is increasing, and we know as the last days unfold. Do you know that in the last days the Bible tells us that there will be wickedness that will increase? There will be challenges for the believer that will increase. Deception will increase. Now, I want to tell you something. You may not be aware of this. The Bible does not promise us a great outpouring. 
Now it does say in Joel there will be an outpouring of his spirit in the latter days. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And we know that. But the Bible doesn't specifically promise us. And I heard Dr. J David Jeremiah say this, so I looked it up. It doesn't specifically promise us that there would be a great outpouring of souls in the last days. Now, I'm praying for that, and I'm believing there will be. The Bible says where wickedness prevails, grace does much more abound. Amen? But the Bible does specifically promise us in the last days in which we are living, there will be great difficulty. There will be deception. Do doctrines of demons will increase and prevail. And as I was standing there and just praying and worshiping the Lord this morning, I just felt the encouragement to you all, Grandview Church, and to you individually to remind you that we shouldn't be surprised at what's happening around us. There's a great deception that we're living in in this world and you shouldn't be surprised to see that there might be people fall away now I'm not talking just about doom and gloom right now because I believe we have the power and the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ as we sang about as believers with the fullness of the Holy Spirit we have the authority and we can see uh, the enemy defeated in these days we are piercing the darkness so there will be victory for the believer, but I don't think we should be surprised at what we see around us with people potentially falling away, with deception increasing. The challenge for us as believers to stand strong in these last days is great, and it's increasing. And we need, I'm so thankful for the way Lisa put that together, we need the power of the Holy Spirit, our, that worship set. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and I want to encourage you as we just come together on this Sunday morning I don't know if you normally do that I assume you do just a chance to worship the Lord just to be in the presence of the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to fill us to charge us with the presence of the Lord to strengthen us in a day in which we need it amen can I hear you say amen um, well that was uh, just a little something the Lord put on my heart and um, so I want to share that with I just want to encourage you I want to encourage Grandview Church. Um, God has positioned you in this time, in this place, for such a time as this. And uh, he is going to use this church. And I'm so excited to be here this morning. And, and quite frankly, I'm excited to potentially be a part of your congregation. Catherine, my wife, um, and I are moving back to Quincy. I say back, she's moving back. This will be the first time that I've had the opportunity to live in Quincy. I've visited over the years uh, many times, been to Quincy, Illinois. We are from uh, Watertown, South Dakota. That's where I spent 16 years pastoring uh, a family worship center, uh, a little church in the frozen tundra, I like to say, up of South Dakota. In fact, one Sunday, I remember it was... Uh, 12, degree, 12 or 13 degrees colder in Watertown than it was on Mount Everest, if that gives you <laughs> any contrast or any uh, context of what it was like in South Dakota. But we spent 16 years. God called us there, raised our family there. I have three children, two biological children, who went from Watertown. One is in Florida, and one is in Phoenix, um, Arizona. They went to thaw out, I think, and go to college. And so that's where they are. I have a, a junior and a freshman in those two colleges. One is in Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, and one is in um, uh, Lakeland, Florida at um, uh, Southeastern University down there. And, so, and then we have a, an adopted son, Louie, who is 13 years old. He's from Haiti, and uh, he will be coming with us and being a part of our um, family here, of course, and I'm just looking forward to the opportunity to just sit, lift my hands, and worship with you guys on Sunday mornings, and be a part of the congregation to encourage us, and so with Pastor being gone this week, uh, he gave me the opportunity to come and share with you uh, a little bit from the Word this morning, and I also thought I would sing a song, if that's okay. <laughs> Might just sing a little song here to get started and uh, share a little music with you this morning. So, Zachary, I guess I'm ready. I want to come out here so I can hear the track a little bit better. 
Maybe you'll recognize this song. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention. I want to introduce to you in this corner of the good and the right stands a champion robed in white his height exceeds the heavens his weight outweighs the world his reach reaches everywhere his age is evermore he is higher than the highest greater than the great no one could ever take his crown away he's more mighty than the mightiest he reigns from above he's the all-time undisputed undefeated champion of love amen this is the story here he left his hometown to enter this arena to raise his hands in victory for me but that angry crowd yelled crucify this king who wore their crown and they gladly watched this champion going down Oh, but I will never count him out For I am a witness of The day he rose to retain the title Champion of love Higher than the highest Greater than the great No one will ever take his crown away He's more mighty than the mightiest. He reigns from above. He is higher than the highest, greater than the great. No one will ever take his crown away. He's more mighty than the mightiest. He reigns from above. He's the all-time undisputed, undefeated champion. The all-time undisputed, undefeated champion. The all-time undisputed, undefeated champion. Amen. Let's give him praise. Amen. Woo. Amen. Well, I, man, I'll tell you what, I, I got to just say that's the first time I've sung in a building that sounded like that. That was amazing. That was fun. You could just hear and hear and it was, yeah, never mind. You don't care about that. <laughs> I wanted to start, I shared a little bit about my story and I'm not going to go back over that with you, but I want to start with just a quick story about a month and a half ago. A gentleman by the name of uh, Justin Manzi came to our church, uh, the Family Worship Center in Watertown, South Dakota. As a result of God's leading and prayer in his life, in my life, as God was leading us to transition out, God had spoken to him and to his family many years ago about the possibility of relocating back to Watertown, South Dakota. He had spent three or four or five years of his life there earlier in his childhood, and this would be a return trip to him. And God would, 
would have been preparing him. I had pastored in Watertown for 16 years, and I was believing God was transitioning us out. And God had put a gentleman into our path to come and to take the church over as my successor. In the process of about a year of that transition taking place, God changed the direction of everything. Unfortunately for my successor, his daughter got very sick, couldn't come, and he had to call me right at the end and tell me the disappointing news. He wasn't going to be able to relocate to Watertown and take over the church. Catherine and I were shocked. We were surprised. We knew there was a sense in our hearts of God's peace. We never felt desperate, but it's one of those things where, wow, what's God doing? We had planned for a year and gone through a lot of effort, but we knew God was working, and unfortunate for Jason, his daughter is doing really well now. She's much more healthy, and his life has taken some turns. God has directed him, but within 24 hours, Justin Manzi called me and said, I heard about the situation. The interesting thing you don't know I didn't mention was that Justin had preached at our church for us just on a whim from one of the congregants told me about this young man. I had him come in a year ago, and he preached, and his daughter, who sang, sang beautifully. I ended up hiring her. She came to be my worship pastor, and she was there for almost a year. He called me and said, I heard the news. I'm so sorry. I said, he said, if there's anything I can do, I'd love to help. We began to talk. I had no idea God was speaking to his heart about the possibility of relocating to Watertown, South Dakota. But he was, and in the process of our conversation, it seemed that God was moving to bring Justin to be the transition pastor of the church that I felt God was leading us out of. We're coming here to Quincy to pray and ask the Lord, what's his next assignment for us? Lord, what do you have for us? We're not done. Uh, God is not finished with us, but we knew he was leading us out. Justin, through the process of time, because Foursquare appoints their pastors, had to go through some, um, some organizational administrative stuff. It turned out that God was placing him at Watertown, South Dakota, and the transition has just recently been completed. It was one year to the day in September that he preached for me a year ago. One year to the day he stood in the pulpit as the transition pastor. Isn't that interesting? And the message that he preached, he started with an illustration, and it really actually changed my um, heart in some ways, changed my thinking. It really encouraged me is what I'm trying to say. He stood up on the platform, and he said, about 28, 30 years ago, I was doing something in Watertown when he lived here, and he said, the mayor came, and he gave me the key to Watertown, South Dakota. And he said, I almost threw it away many times. And he held it up at the service. And he said, here, and he said, I realize now what God might have been doing. I've kept that thing. I almost threw it away. But now here today, I believe it's a confirmation that God has led me to Watertown, South Dakota. And he, he showed the key to Watertown. You know, you get those as an ambassador or you've done something good for the city or the mayor wants to present that to you. Well, little did he know and little did anyone else in the congregation know that 25 years ago or 23-something, I was singing in Quincy, Illinois. You know what I'm going to say? <laughs> I was singing at a church. I don't know which one it was. The mayor was there, and he came up after the service, and he said, Here, Pastor Steve, I want you to have a key to Quincy. <laughs> and there we sat in the same service. He was holding the key to the town that God was calling him to, and I was holding the key to the town that God was calling me to. Isn't that interesting? And that's pretty cool. And so I, I say that to share with you that God confirmed or confirms things in our hearts as he leads us. We step out in faith, and God leads and guides us. He, he can speak to us in ways Sometimes that we don't know that he'll speak, but he has a language, the language of our hearts that can communicate in such a way that confirms things to us. We don't know the next steps that we're to take in this journey that God has us on, but we know we're supposed to be here right now for this season. 
My mother-in-law, Gwen, is here, and my Aunt Pat, wave right there. They came this morning, and we're actually going to be living out in the farmstead house there down on the bottom road, far enough away from the river that the river's not going to get us. <laughs> And uh, we'll be moving in there over the next couple weeks and, and be residing there. So we're just excited to be here to do what God has called us to do, to be a part of this fellowship, to minister, to encourage you guys, minister, and, and, and have a good friendship with Pastor Dennis. How many of you here know what the key to it all is? The key to it all, and that's really what I want to talk with you about this morning. What is the key to it all? I shared this morning just briefly a couple words of encouragement for you individually and for Grandview Church because I believe that there are a lot of challenges that could be facing the church today in our world. There's so much political turmoil, so much deception, so many things that seem like truth to us, makes common sense, but in this world, it's just the opposite. Everything's upside down. The things that you would think would be so obvious, people will tell you that's not the truth. I saw an article the other day that said this gentleman, a wise gentleman, it seemed, or I should say he appeared wise, a scientist, said, yes, it's a fact men can have babies today. And to listen to hear things like that and other things that happen in our world today, it's just obvious that everything is turning upside down. But not for the believer, not for you and I. We just have to realize we are in a battle. We are in a battle, church. Today in our world, it's not easy to hear the gospel message or the word of God preached. When I say it's not easy to hear, it's not that you and I have a hard time hearing it. It's that it's not very prevalent. It's not very obvious. It's not preached. The gospel is becoming changed. It's being watered down. It's changing, church. And that breaks my heart as it does yours to think that somehow it could be in these days as we go forward, hard for a, a person who needs the truth, needs the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's going to be harder for them to hear a pure, unadulterated message of the gospel of Jesus Christ that he saves and heals and empowers with the Holy Spirit today. Amen? So what is the key to it all? What is the answer? I'm going to answer that here in just a, a few moments. The important part of answering that, though, is knowing that our objective is really clear and never forgetting that. What do I mean by that? If you want a good marriage, you keep that as your primary objective. It doesn't just happen, does it? If you want to hear the words, listen, as a believer, if you want to hear those words... Well done, good and faithful servant. How many want to hear those words? Boy, I want to hear those words more than anything else. More than I want to hear the words, Steve Ferguson, I want to hear the words, you did good, faithful servant. And I know that's your desire. It's not about us. It's about what we can do to be obedient to the Father. The problem comes when we lose our objective when we lose a clear understanding, not only of what we're um, facing in this world, why is it difficult and challenged, but what is our primary objective? What is your primary objective, church? There's a lot of messages, and I want to kind of boil things down real simply this morning. I'm fairly simple-minded, and so this morning, what is the clear objective of your life? Have you made it clear? Do you know what it is? And do other people, do the people sitting next to you right now know what your clear objective is? And when I state this today, you might think, well, Pastor Steve, Steve that's relatively simple. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be this morning. Have you made your objective really clear this morning? Or are you searching for purpose and are you drifting about in a world and in a culture that I can tell you right now this morning it's so dangerous that you in any way be drifting and be uncertain. 
unsure. I've seen it with my own eyes, sitting in the congregation as a pastor over the years. People lift their hands, worshiping Jesus, moving towards the front of the church, and then something happens. They start moving towards the middle of the church and then towards the back. Nothing wrong with where you sit. I'm not saying that. But you can see their hearts start to grow colder. And before you know it, something's happened. I've heard, I hear stories. Something has happened in their lives and they've drifted away. And I've been there long enough to see people return and come back. But not after, not before the, the ravages of sin, the difficulties of sin have taken their toll. But thank God, His grace, it doesn't matter. Those things don't matter, but His grace washes us clean and purges us and purifies us. And wherever you are on that journey in your life to grow in the things of God, to pursue Him, to know Him, we're on a journey and you and I together are on that journey today and knowing a clear objective is so important. So you today, I want to talk to you about your clear objective. My kids are in college. I mentioned that to you. We miss them tremendously. It's a different season of our lives. My wife and I, we have a 13-year-old, as I mentioned, and it's different right now to see them in their worlds developing new friends. One thing I'm learning is that they're discovering their purpose. They're discovering on this journey who they are. And it's so thrilling as a parent, as a dad, when my daughter calls and said, Dad, the Lord showed me this and showed me that. And to see my son who is growing in his life and learning his, who he is and his objective. And that church is what we are all doing right now. We're growing. And this morning it's my desire that your objective become clear and that your passion for that objective become greater. I want to read to you a little something this morning. Uh, it's a bio from General Norman Schwarzkopf. How many of you remember him? I, I just really admired that gentleman, gentleman uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf. Let me read to you something about him. For those of you that may not know him, he was born in August 22, 1934, but he died December 27, 2012. He was a United States Army general. And while serving as the commander of the United States Central Command, he led all coalition forces, forces in the Gulf War. Some of you here may have served in the Gulf War, and I want to thank you for your service this morning. Assuming command of the United States Central Command in 1988, Schwarzkopf was called on to respond to the invasion of Kuwait, and in, which was in 1990. He was led by the forces of, the, of Iraq, excuse me, it was led by the forces of Iraq under Saddam Hussein. Initially, he was tasked with defending Saudi Arabia from Iraqi aggression, but Schwarzkopf's command eventually grew to an international force of over 750,000 troops. After diplomatic relations broke down, he planned and led Operation Desert Storm. Do you remember that? Operation Desert Storm. It extended an air campaign followed by a highly successful, listen, 100-hour ground offensive, which in that 100 hours defeated the Iraqi army and removed Iraqi troops from Kuwait. All that happened in 1991. As a result, Schwarzkopf was presented with multiple military honors. In 1946, as a young man, he lived in Tehran, Iran. I don't know if you knew that or not. He grew to be six foot three, 240 pounds, and at an early age, he was a strong and decisive leader with what I'm told or read was a short temper. He served in Vietnam. And he was injured on the battlefield in Vietnam, but he would not leave the battlefield until his uh, objective was accomplished. He re was awarded the Silver Star because of that and would later be awarded a second Silver Star in battle and a Purple Heart. As I mentioned, he would soon rise to become General of the United States Central Command, the highest office. 
And as I mentioned, he was given the, plan, uh, the task of defending Saudi Arabia, Arabia and removing Iraq from Kuwait. The plan that he had arranged or come up with, his operational plan, was dubbed Operation Desert Storm. And it was based on the overwhelming force and strong infantry attack supported by mil uh, artillery and armor. He believed that if you could come in with shock and awe, with a clear objective and force, that it could win the day, win the war in a short amount of time. With that objective in mind, he accomplished his task. He defeated the enemy in 100 hours with minimal casualties. And I'm not minimizing that there were lives lost. There were. But it was minimal. For his services during the war, Schwarzkopf was welcomed back to America with a huge parade down Broadway in New York City, along with many other honors that he received. He became the only person to receive the Distinguished Medal of Honor from the Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Coast Guard. He is the most celebrated general of our time. And again, some of you may have served in, in that war, and I want to thank you for that. But I mention that to you because here's a man who had a clear objective and performed that objective with force and with passion. And it won the day and won the war. What was the key? The key is what I'm talking about this morning. He had a clear objective, and he was completely focused on it. He had a battle strategy that was designed to accomplish that one objective. And his strategies, all of them, aligned to accomplish that objective. He was disciplined, and he did not get involved in civilian affairs to become distracted. And you and I, today, we must too have a clear objective in our lives. And we must not become distracted. We must remain disciplined. We must remain focused and passionate, not only about our objective, but the one who gives us that objective. Can I hear you say amen this morning? Your clear objective this morning <laughs> I just thought, if you choose to accept it, that's crazy. Is this, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that that would produce a love for your neighbor. neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. You and I know that the truth is found right there. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind. What does that mean, Pastor Steve? Well, I wish I had more time. I'm already running out of time. I think for you and I, here's the objective. We must understand. You and I must understand what does it mean to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You say, Pastor Steve, I love the Lord. Well, do you know that in the Bible it tells us that in the last days, there will be people that will be standing at the great white throne judgment. No, the Bema seat of God, the judgment seat. And they will say, Lord, I did this. I cast out demons in your name. I, I, I said these things. I did this in ministry. I spoke in tongues. It sounds like they were Pentecostals. And the Lord will say, depart from me because I didn't know you. How can that be when the last day when we stand before the Lord thinking we're going to receive a reward? And church, this is clearly laid out in Scripture in several occasions in the gospel. And the only thing I can think of is that it's because people either never assumed the objective or never clearly understood the objective. They didn't know him and he didn't know them. It's because they didn't love the Lord with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. You see, it's not going to matter so much what we did, although there will be rewards handed out for the servant, the soldier, who assumes the responsibility that he's called to and does it obediently. But it's not solely based on that. It's based on our objective and did we know him 
Did we know him as Lord and do we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? And did we love our neighbor as ourselves and serve the Lord with a clear objective, a clear passion? You say, Pastor Steve, um, quite a simple message. It is, church, and sometimes I think in these days we lose our objective. We lose the clarity and the passion for it because we see so much of the world. It grabs our attention. Do you know the Bible says in the last days people will become lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, lovers of entertainment? We see that around us with such a prevailing force upon us that it sweeps us away. As believers, we see it time and time again. The Bible tells us that in the last days there will be lies upon lies that will be so overwhelming we won't be able to discern the truth from lies unless we are in love with Jesus and we have a clear objective to know Him and to serve Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Church, I want to tell you this morning that's the message that I know is preached in this church the gospel. The gospel message, the word of God, it's not popular, it's not always pleasant, it's not always palatable, but it is always rich, and it always feeds, and it always deepens our heart and our love for the Lord Jesus Christ in these days. What is our clear objective? What is your clear objective today? Is it to love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because if it is, everything about our lives will flow out of that. And we need, we need to understand, you must understand what it means to love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And church, as a way of understanding, I hate to leave a message kind of open-ended, but that's actually what I'm doing today. I'm leaving it open-ended. Why is that? Because it's my encouragement to you to challenge you to know the Lord, to grow in your heart for Him, your passion for Him. And we might assume something. We might assume we're doing something. But I want you to be sure through the Word of God what it means to love Him. You know, I'll give you a hint. Jesus said in John 5.30, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only do what he asks of me. That's what Jesus' model was. He did what the Father told him to do. He was completely surrendered. He was the first missionary, and he came to this earth. Jesus' objective was always on his mind. It was clear. I think that for us, you and I need to understand what Jesus gave to love the Lord and be obedient to his Father. He gave up everything. And he never lost sight of that. Even when the enemy came against him, even when his own disciples told him, you can't do that. His whole life was ordered. When I say to you, you got to find out what does it mean to love the Lord, I want to tell you that Jesus is our perfect example. Amen? He shows us and tells us and guides us through his word. We cannot know how to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength unless we know Jesus, unless we understand his word, and as we read his word, meditate on his word, meditate on it. You and I are on the threshold of eternity. And you and I, like never before, it's critical that we know our objective. There's a man by the name of Chuck Missler, and he's a Bible teacher, I really love him, wise man, and he has taught me so many things. You know, I don't want to say to you this morning that we just look to men because the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches us, and each and every morning as I wake up and I spend my time in the Word, the Holy Spirit is nurturing and growing my knowledge of the Word, my relationship with Jesus, and nothing, church, nothing can substitute that. But as I've learned from this man, here is something he said. He said, having studied the life and ministry of Jesus for over 40 years, I have found that amidst all the miracles he performed, all the teaching, all the sacrifice he made, three things seem to take precedence over everything else in the life of Jesus. This was clearly his objective. 
love God, love people, and make disciples. And as we walked through three and a half years Jesus did with his disciples, he spent three and a half years with him, is what we understand, the time that he spent with his disciples. Three and a half years. This is what he taught his disciples. Love God, love people, and make disciples. He commands you and I to do the same. What is the key to, the, what is the key to everything? Key to it all, I should say. Having a clear, objective, and undivided heart for Jesus and these three objectives are these three clarifying statements. Love God, love others, and make disciples. Church, this for you and I is our clear objective and the key to it all. I wonder if you would, if you uh, take a moment with me, if we could just bow our heads. And Lisa, maybe if you wouldn't mind coming up and we're going to close the service. And I think I, I went a couple minutes over and please forgive me. Um, but I want to close the service this morning with giving you an opportunity. The reason why I think this is so important this morning in these few moments, this may be the most important aspect of the service today. If you could just take a moment between you and the Holy Spirit and maybe what he has spoken to you. And, um, you know, I know as we talked this morning with, the, with the, uh, Mike, um, the Lord lays out a buffet for us, and we take what we need. The Holy Spirit might have dropped something in you, your heart that you needed this morning. <laughs> I hope he did. But more important than a song or remembering who I am, it's important that you receive what the Lord has put on your heart, and he has given you this morning to let it seal in your heart, and you receive it. So that's what I'd like to do in these moments as we close this service. And I would just ask if you bow your heads with me for this, this morning, these remaining moments that we have together. This is a key time, a key moment in your lives, I believe. I just want to ask you, do you know what your clear objective is in this perverse world? What is your clear objective? Love God, love others, make disciples. Church, this is the key to it all. It's the key to eternity. Have you lost sight of your objective? Has the world come in and either watered that down, caused your heart to grow cold, maybe fond of the things of this world? God forbid that somehow your heart has been turned away from him I want to ask you this morning would you let Jesus let the Holy Spirit right now in these moments soften your heart and would you be willing to say to the Lord Jesus I want you to be the primary clear focus and objective of my life and I want to start with you again today and if you will this morning the Bible says he'll wash clean anything of your life that you've allowed to come in, anything that is pulling on you or has given you an undivided heart, if you'll come to him this morning and say, Jesus, I want you to be the passion of my, I want you to be my primary objective. Will you say that to him this morning? This is a key moment in your life. We are on, and please forgive me, I'm not trying to sound dramatic. I hope you know that we are on the threshold of eternity. Really. And we have a responsibility. You know, Jesus left the mission up to us. He left it in your hands, where you work, where you live, where I live. Up to us to continue on the objective, just like Norm, General Norman Schwarzkopf, to finish this objective with passion. And it happens right here in a service like this, in a seat where you're seated. Will you just tell the Lord Jesus, I want you to be the focus of my life. I'm not going to have you come forward, but I want you to secure that. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. We're going to pray together. Say, Jesus, as me, I've allowed my heart to become divided. I've allowed my heart to become cold. The things of this world, the challenges of this world, they've been overwhelming. I've lost my devotion to you. I've lost it. The Bible says in Revelation, that's going to happen. People's hearts are going to grow mediocre. You don't want that to be you. So would you ask the Holy Spirit, come now. 
soften your heart, put a passion in your heart, church. Jesus, we love you this morning. We praise you, Lord God. Do you know the condition of each of our lives? You know where we are. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would examine our hearts and you hear the prayers of each of us, Lord. Soften our hearts, Lord God. We want to fall in love with you, Jesus. We want to know you, Jesus. We want to walk with you, Lord. The purpose of it all, the objective, clear and defined, is to know you, Jesus, and to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's my prayer. Would you say that to Jesus? That's my prayer today, Lord God. And Father, I thank you today that you're causing the things of this world, these distractions and deceptions, to fall off of the hearts and the minds of people right now. If that's you this morning, just say, I resist you, enemy. I resist those lies in the name of Jesus. Would you do that this morning? I resist those lies. They're defeated. They're cast off. And now, Holy Spirit, say this. Holy Spirit, come and fill me to overflowing with the power of your Spirit. Fill me, Lord, that I might be discerning, that I might be empowered to defeat the enemy, to defeat his lies, and to, to, to be a missionary, to be an evangelist, to be a prophet, to be a teacher, to be a singer, to be an encourager in these last days, and to win our brothers and sisters to Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. You can look at me as we close the service this morning. I pray and speak a blessing over your life that God seal these things upon your heart. Amen. Amen. That God seal that upon your heart. These are difficult times, but we have the authority and we have the victory and the power of the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. That's all I've got for you today. And so I'm not going to just linger on because I've, I've already gone over just a little bit. And I don't know if you normally do announcements or anything to close your service here. Um, would you bow your heads with me? Father, we pray for Pastor Dennis right now. We ask the Spirit of the living God, just give him traveling mercies. Pray that you'd strengthen him to be a, a witness, a, a man obedient, a servant of God that's equipped and empowered by the Spirit right now to give the word that he is supposed to give to these South Koreans and the others who have gathered for such a critical time. A critical time. May you fill him with passion. Give him a word from the Lord for such a time as this, a profound message of God to speak into the hearts. And may you speak into his heart, Lord God, the message that you want him to hear as a result of this conference and this time there. But just protect him, cover him. We pray that the Spirit of the living God just protect his plane and cover him, anoint him for such a time, Lord, that he is obedient to this. In Jesus' precious name, all the church said amen. Amen. God bless you, Lisa, if you have anything to say. Okay, God bless you as you go. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Be encouraged. Amen.